Trump and First Lady Melania Trump toured storm-ravaged parts of Florida and Georgia Monday. Hurricane Michael flattened many homes and businesses during the storm. At least 19 people died. Emergency crews continued to sift through debris. CBS News correspondent Omar Villafranca has the latest. President Trump surveyed the damage from the air and on the ground getting his first look at homes reduced to rubble by the storm. To see this uh, personally, it's, it's very tough. The president and first lady Melania Trump met Lynn Haven resident Michael Rollins, who rode out the storm with his three dogs. I do not know for nature could be this bad. Yeah, this one you could have passed though, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Power crews have been working sun up to sun down to try and restore electricity to the tens of thousands of people in the hardest hit areas. The lines are long for gas in Panama City, but five days after the storm slammed into the Florida panhandle, patience is running thin. They tell us to go to shelters. People ain't got cars. People ain't got gases to get to shelters. As search crews continue working, a body was pulled from a swamp down the coast in Cape San Blas. Nothing like this. Mark Moore and Tony Beck say they tried to get the man to evacuate with them, but he stayed behind. Did you talk to him? I spoke to him personally. What did you tell him? I told him he was out of his mind, if he that stayed. he needed to go, and if he needed somewhere to go, he could follow us to where we were going. You offered him a seat? Offered him. A offered. seat in the car? Yes, yes. Omar Villafranca joins me now from Mexico Beach, Florida. Omar, what was the president's response to what he observed Monday? What are his next steps? Well, he did look over a very large swath. As a matter of fact, here in Mexico Beach, we saw Marine One fly over, and he was accompanied by some ospreys, and they flew over this area, which is one of the hardest hit areas, but he did not land here, just observed from, from the airplane and went farther uh, down towards the Panama City area. And he said on the ground there that he, he didn't know it could be this bad, and that's a sentiment that a lot of people here on the ground have also said. They hadn't really had a hurricane here since the radar era and the one that they get is a category four almost a category five a two mile an hour difference and he basically said he was just eyes open with as all the damage that he saw along this coastline here well omar how many people stayed during the storm and how many people have been accounted for here in Mexico Beach, we talked to the Mexico Beach uh, police chief, and he compiled a list of 230 people after talking to everybody in town. Keep in mind, it's a small town. 230 people said they were going to ride out the storm here in Mexico Beach. That was 15 hours before the storm. Well, the storm comes. He ended up handing that list over to the task force of this area by going through homes like this one here after the storm. They started going, knocking on these doors. You can look over this shoulder here, and believe it or not, that's not a pile of rubble. That's some other homes uh, that were smashed together. They ended up searching that. Cell signals have kind of improved, uh, which have allowed people to make calls to loved ones and to emergency management saying, I'm okay. That number went from 230 and is now to three people unaccounted for. If there's any good news in that, it's three people unaccounted for. And keep in mind, that is in the Mexico Beach area alone. One thing that we are finding is that one certain quadrant uh, might not know what another county is doing and what their numbers are because there's a little bit of lack of communication there. But everybody's just dealing with the world around them, having their own lists and seeing what they can find. What about Omar people displaced by the hurricane? Is there a plan in place to help those folks there is there has been a plan now keep in mind for the people who want maybe who don't have a home um, who had to write it out elsewhere in a home that survived and now don't have a place to go to uh, some of those people are being taken to shelters a little bit farther inland Red Cross and Salvation Army are helping there, stocking it with food and, and water and whatnot but believe it or not there are some people here in Mexico Beach who if their home is still standing even though they have no power or water they are deciding to stay here in that area some of them have generators um, they're relying on maybe Salvation Army or other relief groups that are able to get access 
this here for food. Uh, it, it, in a community like this, they all help each other out. We've also seen volunteers who come up, set up a food truck, and they said it, it will cost you nothing if you're hungry, come and eat. That's what they're doing in the direct Mexico Beach area. Of note, in Panama City, where we were able to drive in from, we saw even some chain restaurants. We saw Outback mm. that was basically telling people, come and eat until we have any more. Waffle House, come and eat till we have any more. That's kind of the plan. The big thing, no power, no water. Connectivity is getting a little bit better. Nobody's watching YouTube videos here. They're barely getting enough bandwidth and cell signal to send messages to family members, and that's a big thing. AT&T is here. They have set up some mobile towers. Verizon is also now here. A lot of people here apparently had Verizon, and they were kind of a little bit upset at Verizon, but a Verizon uh, spokesman had contacted me on social media and said, yes, we are bringing here. They're actually bringing a 4G floating drone to help people when they can, mm. and now they're starting to get a little bit of connectivity, but make no mistake, Elaine, th this is not a, a week process. This is not a month process. This is going to be a year's process to clean up. You know, and Omar, I mean, just looking around, we can get a sense of why, but remind us why it does take so long in these kinds of situations. When you talk about the basic infrastructure essentially being wiped out from a natural disaster like this. Yeah. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, and the basics driving in, there's a lot of roads that are no longer there. When you have a 14-foot storm surge, it takes a lot of things under the, under the road away, too. So roads were gone. We talked to the mayor of Mexico Beach. His water supply, the tanks, is a million-gallon tank, is safe. The problem is his huge main lines, which go all around the town, are snapped in half. When, and his main power poles are snapped in half. He's guessing it's going to take at least two months before they're able to get power here because they've got to set up poles, then they've got a restring line, and if they finally turn those switches for, the, for water, they have, have to make sure that they're fix, fixing those water mains first, otherwise it's going to turn into another little mini flood as well. That also goes for cell phone towers. It, it's all interconnected and it all takes time because mind you, it's not just Mexico Beach. You can go down to Cape San Blas and the county over. You can go up to Panama City. You can go to an, other areas a little bit inland. When you have a 14-foot storm surge, we saw maybe a mile back water that was up three feet. And that is jarring. They have beautiful trees here. You're seeing palm trees here, but farther inland, they have these very tall pine trees. We're talking six, seven stories up. Mm -hmm. Beautiful in the summer to, to block sun, but when they fall over, they're bringing down tension wires. They're blocking the streets. It took them a few days to cut through that just to be able to have more people come in. It is, it is going to be a long, long task to get basic infrastructure going in a lot of these places. There is progress, but people have to be very patient. All right, a massive recovery effort ahead. Omar Villafranca, Omar, thanks very much.